It was the spring of 1973, a Sunday evening congregational meeting at the Evangelical Free Church in Iowa City. The chair of the deacons, we would call them elders, was all of 23 years old and he was presiding over the meeting. A member made a motion to terminate the pastor's contract. The vote to terminate passed by one vote on a simple majority. In the aftermath of the debacle, one older woman communicated that she had misunderstood the motion and she voted to terminate when she meant to vote in support of the pastor. Whether or not Pastor Dave would have accepted a one margin positive vote will never be known. The chair was clearly out of his comfort zone and experienced with, inexperienced with respect to good process. The vote did not go as he had hoped. Immediately after the meeting, the chair and the pastor sat in his car parked between the church building and the parsonage. Pastor Dave was in his mid-40s, father of three teenagers. Within a few weeks, the family would be required to move out of the parsonage and he had no future plan in mind. The primary complaint about Pastor Dave was that he, quote, spends too much time mentoring young leaders. He doesn't pay enough attention to older members. I remember this was the Vietnam era. Anyone over 30 was old and could not be trusted. In fact, seven individuals from the congregation, all in their early 20s, were planning to enroll in seminary studies that fall including the chair of the deacons who had just presided over a vote to fire the pastor. And through his literal tears, the pastor asked the proverbial $60,000 question, after what you've seen tonight, do you really want to start seminary in a few months? And the chair was probably naive enough to think, but I doubt this would ever happen to me. I know and remember those details of the entire incident quite well. It was just the pastor and me in that car. The entire story would take another 30 minutes to tell, but several months later, we moved to Harrisonburg with a three-week-old son, where I enrolled at Eastern Mennonite Seminary. We came to EMS because of two formative conversations with our own Ed Stolzfus, then pastor at First Mennonite Church in Iowa City. And within a few weeks, Pastor Dave, who had been unceremoniously fired, accepted an invitation to lead a church plant. And on our last Sunday before leaving Iowa City, I was invited to preach the first sermon for the new church. And that afternoon, we were honored at a reception in the old church. And as I've reflected on this over these years, that one day turned out to be a microcosm of my entire career in leadership, whiplashed between competing perspectives and deeply held convictions. Perhaps most instructive is that the new church was, against all conventional wisdom, built primarily with university students. Seven years later, I was the guest speaker for their annual homecoming, more than 200 regular attenders, the majority university students, they were supporting two and one half full-time equivalent pastors and staff, and they were sending contributions beyond the congregation. I've never been invited back because by then I was too Anabaptist in my theology and I was advocating for women in leadership. George R. Brunk III, Don Augsburger, and other professors at EMS had influenced me in profound ways, and for the new church plant, heavily committed to the teachings of Bill Gothard, it was just a bridge too far. As John has said, today's service is the first of three with a focus on growing young. Pastor Mariah has led a conversation among a group of young and older PVMCers around the book, helping us to think about characteristics of congregations and leaders that attract and retain youth and young adults. It's a crucial conversation to engage. Most of us are aware of our context. A rapidly growing segment of our population in the U.S. identifies their religious commitments as none. 
We don't have time this morning to delineate all the reasons for that phenomenon. Suffice it to say that the statistics do not lie and they won't be reversed by nostalgic dreams about the past. So at first glance, I think my story of failure as a young leader that resulted in a very difficult transition for the E-Free pastor could be seen as a reason not to invite young adults into leadership roles. And in fact, the story, as painful as it is to recall, illustrates a foundational principle of growing young, and that is that effective leaders are known as keychain leaders. They walk alongside youth and young adults in a mentoring role as they give access to the keys. So I can't blame anyone else for my actions, but it's also true that no older adult other than the pastor was available to mentor me in that role. And in this particular case, he had an obvious conflict of interest, so he couldn't really help me walk through the process. No one, at least so far as I remember, suggested that I should contact denominational leaders to find a way to walk through that process. Now, maybe, it's always possible that there were some older adults who were trying to mentor me and it just simply fell on deaf ears. So as John has already introduced, one analogy of the Growing Young book is that of new drivers learning to drive a car. It's not a one-time event. It's a method that stretches over years. Responsible adults wouldn't consider handing a 16-year-old son or daughter the keys to the family car to take a trip on I-81 to Pennsylvania, at least not the first time behind the wheel. There's a careful process, or at least there should be, by which one develops competent drivers. There's a period of observation. Our little children watch us, and grandchildren now, watch us and learn something about how we drive, and I must say, by the observations that I've seen even this week, I saw two people in Harrisonburg run red lights. That's not a good thing to show children and grandchildren, but they begin to learn by watching. Usually, early on, an inexperienced driver is under the watchful eye of a terrified adult driver. And along the way, one takes driver education classes. Some parents require that a teen driver will not carry other passengers in the car with them in order to reduce the potential for distraction. They might request that no music is played while driving, and if needed, there is actually nowadays technology available to monitor speed and emergency braking events. I don't know if any of you watch or see on a daily basis the Daily Bonnet. It's a satirical humor email that comes out pretty much daily. And they announced just on Thursday that the Mennonites in Winkler, Winkler, Manitoba, are instituting a new level of driver training lower than learner. People at that level will be required to put a sign in their back window showing that they are a Winkler driver, and they will deploy their airbags prior to accidents for safety, and they will drive only on Sunday afternoons at a speed of less than 30 kilometers per hour. (laughs) Effective organizational leaders take a similar approach as they develop future leaders, and Pastor Mariah wisely encouraged us to create an apprentice role for a young person on the Congregational Council. And he or she will be invited to serve for one year, not an unrealistic three-year commitment. They will have a full vote. I may be in the minority, but based on my experience 50 years ago, I'd offer this person should probably not be chairing the council. (laughs) But we need to hear their voices and they will gain valuable experience by observation and involvement, and ideally there will be many teachable moments. Pairing the young adult with another council member could actually enhance those opportunities to learn. So just to be clear, even though I failed in that particular situation, I did learn later in life along the way from numerous people in this congregation 
Myron Augsburger, Lee Yoder, Gordon Zook, Irvin Stutzman, Joe Lapp. And I have learned from female leaders. I was fortunate to have female board chairs during my years at EMU. And Carl Smeltzer actually signed my ordination certificate in Iowa, Nebraska conference. So let me be clear. I learned from all these people. I worked with Shirley Yoder. I learned, I'm sure I'm missing other people, people that taught me much. But I also have to acknowledge that whatever state mistakes I made along the way cannot be blamed on them. Those are my responsibility. It's our intent to continue inviting youth and young adults to lead portions of our worship services. Given that many adults say they dread public speaking more than death, this is no small effort. It's actually called glossophobia. And studies indicate that as many as 75% of adults experience it at some level. And I can honestly say that if someone had told me in high school that my professional life would require multiple speaking events every week, I would have opted to stay in the family's farm implement business. And I have way too many stories like John's. Pastor Mariah did a great thing by inviting several young adults to share the sermon time earlier this summer. During a five minute, or doing, I should say, a five minute sermon is a great learning experience where 20 minutes could be unnecessarily intimidating. I remember asking Myron Augsburger one time. I was in my 20s. He's a little younger then than he is now. But he had a lot of experience, and I remember asking him at the, over a dinner meeting at Martin House, how do you have enough material to fill a 20 to 30, 40 minute sermon? <laughs> and his response was, well, when you get older and have more experience, the problem is gonna be to know what to cut out. He was right. The second focus of the growing young book I was asked to highlight is from chapter four, taking Jesus' message seriously. Kenda Creasy Dean, professor of youth, church, and culture at Princeton Theological Seminary, sums up one of the central findings of a study. By the way, she was the dissertation advisor to Sarah Bixler, who spoke here several weeks ago. And she calls it the theology of most youth, based on research, moralistic therapeutic deism, MTD, Moralistic meaning that religious young people equate faith with being good moral people, generally being nice. It's therapeutic, so faith becomes a means of feeling better about themselves, and it's deistic, meaning that God exists, but this God doesn't necessarily involve himself in our daily lives with any regularity. I don't have any data to support this, but I'm guessing that MTD describes the theology of many adults as well. Christian congregations that are doing well at growing young hold a more robust theology that is centered on the person of Jesus. We follow a Jesus who does not condemn, but sets people free. The Jesus who takes what is broken and restores wholeness. The Jesus who invites us as followers into a life of discipleship that requires sacrifice, the Jesus who embodied the fullness of God's unconditional love and unending faithfulness. We stand here in the Anabaptist tradition. I'd offer that every congregation stands in a theological tradition, although some say they're non-denominational, and therefore that means they're more faithful because they're not bound by any particular tradition. And I think that's a dangerous myth. I'll take it a step further. They are committed to a tradition. It's one that in the U.S. leans toward American civil religion. But if we are committed to Anabaptism, how might that inform the way we mentor and teach our youth? I'll just offer four very brief, not exhaustive elements. One, we emphasize both the life and teachings of Jesus. 
Jesus didn't just teach us how to live, but he demonstrated in his life what it means to love everyone, to associate with the marginalized, to live in the upside down kingdom. In the words of Father Richard Rohr in his post of just yesterday, Jesus is describing what the world would look like if people really followed him. He's giving us an upside down kingdom version of reality that turns middle class morality on its head. Secondly, the Sermon on the Mount is our best window into what Jesus expects of those who would follow him. We might assume that every Christian tradition takes that kind of understanding seriously, that the Sermon on the Mount is our best way and that it applies to all of us. In fact, there are some traditions who would say the Sermon on the Mount only applies to the set-aside religious. And there are other traditions that would say, mostly the fundamentalist tradition would say, no, the Sermon on the Mount is just for a certain dispensation of time. It doesn't apply to all of us. So that leaves us off the hook. There's a simple mantra that I think is a helpful reminder. Jesus meant what he said, he said what he meant, and he was talking to us. Thirdly, we interpret the Old Testament and the entire Bible through the eyes of Jesus. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you. If one reads the Bible as a flat book with no attention to how Jesus interpreted the Jewish scriptures, it's easy to condone violence. Our peace position that we hold as Anabaptists rests on a view of the Bible that it is the record of God's unfolding revelation. Heil's Geschichte, the story of salvation history. And Pastor Paula will recall that approach very well from the required Heston College course. And sometime we should have you come up here and just do that recitation again of Heil's Geschichte because the final exam was a written or oral recitation of Heilsgeschichte. I think it's a course every member of the Mennonite Church should probably be required to take. And fourth and last, Anabaptists understand that discipleship is best lived out in the context of a visible body of believers, not as individuals. And that's a radical message in our day of individualism. It's one reason, among others, that I find political libertarianism to be in tension with what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Unfortunately, we're seeing that in our culture these days, and it's literally killing people because people don't care enough for the common good. Many of us will remember the Bibles of our childhood where there were the red letter editions that had the letters, or the words of Jesus in red. There's a movement some years ago started by Tony Campalo and uh, Shane Claiborne called Red Letter Christians. One of the organizations that that group highlights is Raw Tools Incorporated, which turns guns into tools of peace, very much like the beautiful sculpture that we have on the campus at EMU created by Esther Augsburger and their son, Mike. This upside down kingdom to which Anabaptists have subscribed is a message for our youth that resonates with those who are disillusioned by the pablum that passes for Christianity in much of our culture. It rejects the popular prosperity gospel. It challenges an easy faith that ignores God's kingdom come on earth and emphasizes only life eternal and it refuses to equate following Jesus with allegiance to any earthly kingdom. I close with a quote from Elias Shakur. When I understand Jesus' words in Aramaic, I translate it like this. Get up, go ahead, do something. Move, you who are hungry and thirsty for justice, for you will be satisfied. Get up. Go ahead, do something, move, you peacemakers, for you shall be called children of God. This, I believe, is the heart of our invitation to our youth and young adults. Amen.